John 6, verses 7 through 12, about God as the provider and the three voices, Jesus, Philip, and Andrew, as they discuss the problem. The feeding of the 5,000 is about needs and wants. And we can be honest with each other. We are horrible at separating wants from needs. We get them all confused. And so this passage really helps me deal with that in my own life, the separation between wants and needs. So let's look at John chapter 6. I want to give us the full context, so I want to read all 14 verses of the feeding of the 5,000, but we're going to focus in on verses 7 through 12. So John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14 says this, my friends. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing what a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, picking on poor Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Last week's passage. All right. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fishes. Fishes and loaves, imagine that. But what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he dis distributed to those who were seated. Likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. Wants versus needs. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. Jesus is pro-leftover. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. So we're going to be looking at those middle verses and then the last two verses we'll look at next week. So there's a lot going on here. So let me give you the sermon in the sentence, a topic sentence to hang all the details on, a chapter heading, if you will. The sermon on the sentence says this, in a conversation, an event for apostle training, that's the purpose of this whole chapter, Jesus, Philip, and Andrew solve the hunger problem of the crowd. John chapter 6, verses 7 through 12. I was having some fun with that language, right? The three of them solve the problems. It's very interesting. The purpose of the feeding of the 5,000 that immediately jumps out to you and I is that God is the provider. It's about the provision of the Lord. God provides the most basic needs of life. That's the lesson of the feeding of the 5,000. God is the source of the basic elements of life. In the Old Testament, Moses, after God uses Moses as a deliverer to free the Israeli slaves in Egypt, we see God as provider for four decades in the wilderness. God provides water in the desert from a rock. God provides in the dew every morning manna, bread flakes, like dehydrated bread, uh, manna. I like the word manna. Manna is not a word we use, but manna is Hebrew for what is it? That's what 
manna means. Manna means, what is it? What is that? And it's the bread that is left after the dew. God provides bread to the Israelites for 40 years. They complain about it, so God also supplies quail. Meat on the table. God provides. He provides the basic ingredients for sustaining life. Bread and water. That doesn't relate to you and I. The basic ingredients, the basic food for life for an American is not bread and water. That's what prisoners get in the, you know, uh, in the dark ages. For us, it would be French fries. Yeah, French fries. That's an American uh, food that has a foreign uh, state named after it. We probably call that freedom fries, right? French fries. And then we argue over which French fries are the best. There's the McDonald's crowd, the Burger King crowd, the Mama crowd, right? French fries. French fries and soda would be our basic elements of life. And the thing is, is God provides the basic elements of life. He provides everything that we need. He doesn't necessarily provide everything that we want. And we confuse the two. And so we spend a lot of time dreaming about what we want. We spend time in prayer, praying for God to provide what we want. And then God doesn't provide it. And we get frustrated And then we say, God has abandoned me. I didn't get fry sauce with my fries. Lord, what's up with that? Not realizing that he supplies our needs, not necessarily our wants. And that often he denies things to you and I, like good parents, because they are not good for you. No, little Johnny, you cannot have cake before dinner. No, you cannot have three scoops of ice cream. It's not good for you. Parents look out for their children by saying no to what they want rather than what they need. No, you do not need 16 hours a day on your Switch playing video games. No, no, let's put a timer on that sucker. you got to read for 30 minutes, then you can play video games for 30 minutes. And then, please, generation, go out and smell fresh air. I mean, go outside once in a while. We meet needs, not wants, and God is the same thing. It's true, he's a horn of plenty, providing what is needed to sustain life. And we see that in Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness. I mean, nothing even wore out for them. The clothes, the sandals. God sustained and provided the basic elements of life for everything for them while they wandered around in the desert. This is Jesus. And Jesus is feeding the 5,000 men. So there are more people here. They're only counting the men because of the society that they are in. So you know there's there's 5,000 men, uh, there's at least 5,000 women. And you never go on a trip without taking the children. So you know there's 5,000 children. It's, It's a big group, for sure, that is sitting down here in the grass and eating. A big group. And Jesus is doing this in order to meet a very practical need. This crowd is in the middle of nowhere. And they... This crowd has been following Jesus for a long time. And this crowd has been uh, listening to him because Jesus was long-winded. And so he sees their need and says, I know you're thinking about lunch. Give me a moment. And then he provides for them 12 baskets of leftovers from five fish and two loaves. He provides bread and fish And the leftovers are more than the original source. Because it's a miracle of God. Bounty flowing from almost nothing. Like the water from the rock in the desert. Like manna, what is it in the dew? Or quail coming through. 
in response to their complaining. Jesus is making a statement that God provides, but Jesus is also making a statement that he, Jesus, Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the triunity, is also the provider. He doesn't really offer you and I bread. He offers himself. Jesus is the bread, the basic element of life. And we will see that in the second half of the chapter, that he's the bread of life that gives us sustaining. So it starts with that. He's laying the foundation for that message that is coming, that he is the basic element of existence for us. Jesus is saying he's the French fries. He's the soda. He's the air that we breathe. He's behind every heartbeat we have. It's an expression of parents taking care of their children, loving them and providing for them, being beautiful for, to them. Jesus, Jesus is the source for us. He's the place to go to, to have all of our needs met. That's the big message of the 14 verses. But we can't talk about God as provider meeting our needs without stopping it and asking, well, what do I need? What do you need? If we're not good at separating needs from wants, what's our need that Jesus meets, my friends? The first and foremost need is that he provides life to the dead. He provides spiritual existence for the enemies of God that we were. So Jesus meets the need by forgiving us of our sins. Need met. I have sins that need to be forgiven. Jesus, his death and blood on the cross meets those needs so that my sins are forgiven, so that I, as a forgiven and sinner, can have an intimate and passionate relationship with a holy, pure, and innocent God. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting really needs. It turns out we may want angel wings, but we don't need them. What we need is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. We may want to be celebrities and have everybody love us, but what we need is an intimate and passionate relationship with the divine. And Jesus provides that. It's because of the death and blood of Jesus Christ that makes it possible for the Father in heaven to be our Father, for us to have an adopted relationship with him so that we're the adopted sons and daughters of the kingdom of God. You are a prince. You are a princess. You are special and beautiful to our divine Father in heaven. That's what we need. We need that intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. It turns out what we want is model-like bodies, perpetual youth, and pretty much just free money. That's what we want. But what we really need is an eternal purpose. We need a, a divine, timeless reason to get out of bed and let our feet hit the floor and go through another difficult day. And Jesus meets that need by giving us, his children, a divine purpose. And that is to love God, to reach people, to make and grow disciples, and to serve others those four verbs sound familiar to me. So we've got a reason to exist. We've got a purpose. We've got goals. What do you need, my friend? I mean, really. The question we need to ask and talk about. That's God as provider. Let's look at Philip Andrew, and Jesus, right? Those are the three voices, Philip, Andrew, and Jesus. It starts off with Jesus singling Philip out. So let's look at Philip. 
Philip, in verses 5, 6, and 7, I love it. He, he is such, Philip is such a practical guy. Jesus asks him a specific question. Yo, Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? And Jesus' answer is great. Very practical, very down, down to earth. Let's just review it. Let's look at 5, 6, and 7. Remember 5, 6, and 7 after Jesus calls him out. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing what a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test Philip, because Jesus knew what Jesus was intending to do. So Philip's answer, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. 200 denarii, what in the world is that? A denarii is one day's wage. So that's 200 days worth of working. 200 days of your, of your annual salary. Six months of what you would earn. All right, Philip. Who is Philip? Philip isn't one of the big three, right? Peter, James, and John. Who is Philip? Well, we know that Philip was initially a follower of John the Baptizer. So he started off with John the Baptizer and then was sent to Jesus. That's what we know. We know Philip should have a last name, but he doesn't. And so there are more than one Philips, just like there's more than one John. I wish these guys had last names. John the baptizer, John the apostle, John the elder, John the evangelist, John Jamar, right? Uh, I'm the only one with the last name. Same thing with Philip. You've got Philip the apostle. This is Philip the apostle. In the book of Acts, you'll have Philip the evangelist which may or may not be Philip the Apostle, but probably not. Because that Philip, Philip of the Evangelist, wasn't an apostle, but a deacon. He was called to be a deacon along with Stephen. So a different Philip, probably. So we know Philip started off with John the Baptist. We know Philip is called out by Jesus here in John 6. We know that Philip will warn Peter later on. So yeah, he does a little something, something later too. Philip's a good guy. He's in training. And I love his approach because his approach is very practical. Oh, yeah, this is a problem. This is a money problem. He's immediately Wall Street. He's marketing. He's a capitalist. We can't afford this problem, Jesus. We don't have enough money. He's a very good practical decision maker and we need practical decision making we do he's a realist he's very pragmatic and because he's very pragmatic he sees the problem and he comes up with a very practical issue we need to buy bread for these guys and we cannot afford to buy bread for these guys a practical problem solver is somebody you need on your team to help you solve problems because they often get uh, right to the issue and address additional problems. And so Philip is that guy. Practical, pragmatic problem solvers are also very quick. They're the first ones to go, hey, hey, hey uh, you, can't, you can't do that. And that's what Philip was doing. And they tend to charge kind of head on to solve the problem. It's the practical problem solvers that will solve a problem too fast and accidentally make it worse. But you need those guys because the practical issues need to be addressed. This reminds me of a King Solomon. King Solomon was the wisest person. King Solomon, the son of David, was the first wise guy. I couldn't help but make that joke. Sorry. I, it, was, it was there. I had, to, I had to say it. King Solomon was presented with two women who were fighting over one baby. They had both had babies. One baby had died. They both claimed the living baby. They wanted King Solomon to make a, a decision. A, a, yeah, a, a royal decree and decide who's the mama. King Solomon, being a wise guy, says, okay, 
We'll cut the baby in half. One of you will get the top. One will get the bottom. Problem solved. And one woman was okay with it, and the other woman was not okay with it. And said, if you're going to cut the baby in half, just give the baby to the other lady. And King Solomon came to the conclusion that the woman that was okay with cutting the baby in half was not the mother. And the woman who was willing to sacrifice the relationship with the baby to save the baby's life must have been the mother. Practical, practical approach, right? I mean, he was practical, he was quick, he was head on. King Solomon was a realist and a pragmatic solver. He was a wise guy, very full of wisdom. When we look at the Bible, Old Testament, there are five wisdom books, Proverbs, Psalms, Job, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs are all wisdom books. And I like Proverbs because Proverbs is full of wisdom for daily living. We get the idea of Old Testament wisdom wrong. We think wisdom is common sense. And there's an aspect that that is true. The Hebrew word for wisdom is about practical application. It's actually getting the work done, doing it. The difference between theory. A theoretical physicist is not wise. An engineer is wise. They're able to put it together. You don't go to the officer responsible for the maintenance shop on base to get something done. Theoretical rather than practical. You go to the NCO who actually knows how to turn the wrench and they will solve it. You can watch a YouTube video all you want about the intricacies of plumbing and convince yourself that you can solve the plumbing, plumbing problem in your house. And three minutes into a five-minute project, you realize it'll take you three weeks. The difference between theoretical versus practical. Wisdom is all about practical. Philip was showing practical advice. He was showing wisdom even though he didn't actually know how to solve this problem. He didn't get it. Which then brings us to Andrew. Andrew. And it, Andrew gets two verses, verses 8 and verse 9. And Andrew isn't so much practical as he is observational. Andrew's got his eyes open. Andrew's got his ears ready to listen. He's checking out what is going on. And so Andrew's approach is different. He speaks up and he offers a solution, even though it's a small solution. Remember verses 8 and 9. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. We don't know much about Philip. And we don't know much about Andrew. We know Andrew also, like Philip, started off with John the baptizer. We know Andrew is the brother to Peter. We know Peter is a loudmouth who always says and does the wrong thing until after Pentecost. If, it's, if you're going to open up your mouth and stick your foot in, you're being a Peter. I appreciate that about him. I've got some experience doing that myself. So Andrew, being his brother, that must have rubbed off because Jesus asks Philip, Philip makes this very practical marketing capitalism problem, and Andrew steps in and says, hey, there's this guy here, there's this kid here who has lunch, but it's not enough to do anything. Five barley loaves, that's like the cheap dried bread Two fish, they would have been salted fish, little fish. These aren't halibut, these aren't salmon. These are little bait fish, we'd call them. Andrew's a good guy. Andrew's very observational. And that's the struggle for you and I. We're quick to make judgments so we don't tackle problems with observation, so we could really learn from this. 
We need to be more like Andrew. He was intentionally observant. And so we should be intentionally observant. Especially when there's a problem around us. Instead of immediately offering a suggestion like Andrew did, let's look around and see what's going on. The answer may in fact be behind us. Physically look around. Look for the resources. Open your ears to see what other people are talking about, what the environment has to say to us. We need help to be intentionally observant because, you know, we're not. Our eyes are on our phones. Our, our ears are in our head where we're, we're focusing in on the voice uh, in our thoughts. We're not actually paying attention, especially when driving distracted drivers, or when the spouse is talking, right? We need to be intentionally observant. We need to ask probing questions. Ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Ask questions from anybody that might possibly have any information that could help address the problem. That's why Jesus asked Philip, the question. Asking the right question is a sign of knowledge, not knowing the right answer. So we, let's ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. You should ask questions. You should exhaust the resource of questions that can be asked because you need more and more information. The worst thing is to not ask somebody a question and they're there with the perfect answer and solution. And yet, we don't want to seem like we don't know. And so we're quiet. And just ask. It'll be all right. And then you get a bunch of answers from these questions. You get a bunch of data and information from all you're observing. But then what you've got to do is you've got to challenge the answers. Just because you ask questions from seven people doesn't mean the seven people actually know what's going on. It doesn't mean that what they said was useful. You have to really challenge their answers to your questions on whether it's true or not. Whether it's a half-truth or not. Whether it's completely wrong how horrible would it be for you to ask somebody a question, they give you some wisdom that is wrong, and you charge forward because of it? So we need to challenge their answers. I'm not saying be rude to the person. Never tell anybody that's the stupidest thing you've ever heard. I know you think it, but don't say it out loud. In your head, challenge all the answers. Look for confirmation of answers. Figure out the real facts. Because by doing that, you are forming understanding. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach the apostles. Jesus is teaching the apostles through this miracle that God is provider, that Jesus is the provider, that Jesus is the bread, not just the giver of bread. But he's also teaching these apostles how to solve problems and how to make decisions in preparation for when Jesus ascends back up to heaven. He's doing leadership training. And we can learn from that. So let's form some understanding. We see this in the Bible. We see this in the Bible a lot. Abram and Lot, they both had a lot of herds. And their herdsmen were not getting along, and their herds were not getting along, and they were fighting over water rights. And Abraham and Lot come together to figure this out. And so they have one of these conversations, and they decide it's better to separate. So Abraham, the older of the two, says, Lot, you pick. Do you want to stay in the mountains, or do you want to go down the valley? Let's separate our stuff. It's a very observational solution. How about Nehemiah? 
Nehemiah is in Israel. He's building the walls. The workmen are complaining because there's a threat of, of raiders who are going to come in and kill them to stop them from building the wall. So Nehemiah hears all of this. He observes. And his solution is, okay, we'll divide the workforce. Half of the workers will work on the wall, and the other half will stand guard with spears to protect the workers. Practical solution. Observation. We need to be more practical, like Philip, and we need to be more observational, like Andrew. Jesus, though, Jesus does it. This passage ends with Jesus giving two commands. Have them sit, one command, and then after the event, a gather up the leftovers. John chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. I want to remind you of what the text says. So let's look at verses 10, 11, and 12. Here it goes. Jesus said, have the people sit down. See, the command is have, sit. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. We talked about that. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, so the crowd was filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. Get it? Jesus said, sit. Jesus prayed. And then Jesus said, gather up the leftovers. Those are the three. Let's look at sit. Have the people sit down. Jesus' command gives them an opportunity to obey. When we are facing a desperate need and we are looking for God's provision, it's always good, it's always good to obey him. Right? I mean, as a kid and you were going to go ask your folks for that special whatever, Mom, can we go to Domino's tonight? Instead of eat your bad cooking. If you were smart, you like cleaned your room first. Or wash dishes so that she saw you. That's good husband preparation. You're washing dishes. Uh, Mom, I washed all the dishes. It'd be a shame to dirty these tonight for dinner. Can we go to Domino's? It's always good to obey. Because what we don't realize is that often God delays meeting a need because he is preparing us. He's either preparing us to receive from God or he's preparing others on the periphery to be instructed or blessed or affected by him meeting our needs. So it's very important for us to wait, obey, prepare, get in position. The text says only those who sat ate. The ones who were sitting got food. Because if you're not going to obey Jesus, you ain't getting it. And so it's important for us to realize that there's obedience here. And obedience is important. You can't ask from mom and dad while rebelling against them. That never works, right? It never works. That results in a beating. Uh, when I was growing up. When I was growing up, it was go get a switch. And, and if you don't know what a switch is, God bless you. It's not a video game. It's a stick you got that they then hit you with. And that was an art form too, because you didn't want to get too, you know, noodly of a stick. So it would be easy on you. But you also didn't want to get to a big branch either. You didn't want to arm the enemy. Well, the same is true with God. You can't go to your heavenly father in rebellion to him. And then get mad that he doesn't meet your needs. We've got to obey. We've got to prepare. We've got to get in position, my friends. We struggle with this. I struggle with this. You struggle with this. We always struggle with obedience to God. And it's a growing process. So the longer you walk with him, the more victory and the easier it becomes. Absolutely. So he says, have the people sit down. The second thing 
isn't a command, but it's something that Jesus does. Did you see that? And having given thanks is what the text says. Jesus gives gratitude to God the Father. He's praying for the food, for sure. But I imagine he's praying for other things as well. Thanking God for the apostles. Thanking God for Philip and Andrew. Thanking God for the people who are about to receive. Thanking God for the lad and his lunch and his parents who provided the lunch. God, God gets a bad rap because we remember when he doesn't meet our needs or our wants. When we feel slighted. And we rarely come to him with an attitude of gratitude. And my friends, Thanksgiving is a lifestyle, not a holiday in November. We are so, you and I are so blessed. We are overwhelmed with our blessings. Even if you are having the worst day of your life, the worst week of your life, the worst month of your life, if April has been a month of torture, pain, and suffering on you, you are still blessed if you will pause a moment and count your many blessings and name them one by one. It's the person who complained about not having any shoes until he met the person who had no feet. And then he was grateful for his feet. We are the blessed. And we have so much to be grateful for. And we need to live in a lifestyle of thanksgiving toward God and toward the people around us. God is the source of all good in my life. So anything good in my life right now is because of God. Anything good that has ever happened to me personally, my entire life, is a result of God's blessing. Most of the bad stuff that has happened in my life, uh, I did to myself. So I can approach God with a heart of gratitude, thanking Him and praising Him for His presence in my life and for Him blessing me, even during the worst day, the worst week, the worst month of my existence. Because he is good, and he has been good. And that's true for you, as well as it is for me, my friend. It even applies to parents. We often don't say nice things about mom and dad until their funeral. Instead of having a moment and thanking them for all they did for you, raising you. Because you were a handful. I mean, you were hard on them personally. You were hard on their marriage. I mean, gray hair came from you. They did the best they could. No parent is perfect except our Heavenly Father. Let's be grateful and thankful for the people around us. You guys are such a blessing to me. Let's show gratitude and thanksgiving when we live our lives. I think Jesus prayed for Philip and Andrew, for the lad, for the people that were there. This is a prayer. Jesus is praying to God the Father. This is communication. And as, as easy as it is for us to agree that we are not grateful enough, it's also easy to agree that we are not communicative enough with God or the people around us. We don't pray enough. And we don't talk to the people that love us enough. And so this is a great example. Even Jesus prayed to God the Father. So let's commit ourselves to gratitude and to praying and talking to the people around us. And then the second command. Gather up the leftovers, the fragments, 
that nothing may be lost. Jesus likes leftovers. I'm not a fan of leftovers. I'm not. Leftovers. Gather up. Why did Jesus tell the disciples, the 12 apostles, to gather up the leftovers? It's a command. Jesus is commanding them to gather up the leftovers. Why would Jesus do that? I think the answer is obvious. He was doing that so the 12 apostles had proof and evidence that a miracle had happened. That God is the provider, Jesus is the provider, Jesus is the bread. They handed out five, fishes, uh, five loaves and two fishes, and they brought back 12 full shopping carts full of leftovers. So that each apostle, 12 apostles, 12 baskets. So each apostle had one proof. How did this happen? It's evidence of the miraculous, my friends. If we will open our eyes and our ears. Be open to the possibility that God is good and God is working. We will find evidence of God's miraculous hand all around us. And we need to gather that up and remember, we need to build monuments to God's miraculous work in our lives so that we can find comfort and reassurance from what God has done when we encounter the next difficult time. Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost so that everything may be gained. Right, my friends? So let's sit. Let's pray. Let's gather. I can really summarize this four ways. Prepare, pray, gratitude, and obey. And we need to be working on this. We need to apply this to our lives. Every single one of us can do this. This is what we need to be talking about at lunch. How can I prepare better? How can I pray better? How can I live in gratitude and thanksgiving more? How can I show you how thankful I am for you? And then, how can I obey more what God has said in his word? His do's and his don'ts. Let's obey, let's obey, let's obey. We need to discuss this, my friends. 